Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Science Facts and Fallacies podcast. Cameron and Kevin with you here, as always, only he's not here. So Cameron not here, as always. So um, I'm Kevin. I'll be your host today. And joining me today is a special guest. And my old friend who I've known forever, but I don't know if we've ever met in person, but <laughs> or even, or even, <laughs> yeah, even on video, I don't think we ever have. That's right. We have not. Yeah. So welcome aboard, uh, Michelle Horning. And Michelle, she's a uh, works for the federal government in a really cool gig that involves virology and immunology as an expert in many of these areas. But she's also a diamond in the cesspool of social media. Uh, when you uh, read her tweets on Facebook and Twitter, and well, you don't have tweets on Facebook, her messages on Twitter and Facebook, she really does add to the conversation. And she's about to launch a very useful um, effort. So tell us a little bit about that, Michelle. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to be called Doc H. And um, the website that I bought, and, you know, this is a work in progress, is called Doc H Explains. I'm the farmer scientist. And my mission is to actually create video content and, uh, and fascinate people by way of agriculture, just like I was fascinated, and also to deal with the, the misinformation that's out there. I mean, we already saw what happened um, during COVID. We saw a big division. We saw a lot of misinformation in view of the vaccine. And we don't want to see that in agriculture. No way. So I'm excited about this. I hope that I can get up and running this month. And, and uh, Mark, Mark uh, Draco is actually part of, part of the, <laughs> the process with me. He's, he's my fun team friend. And uh, I hope to get up. And, and, and when when it happens, where would people find this? Do you have um, like, the social media in place and everything? Yes, um, social media. I hope to have my website up. Um, so Facebook, possibly Twitter, Instagram, all the big ones, really. And uh, I think the big one's going to be Facebook and Instagram, though. And you already and YouTube. have the, Oh, very good. So, so yeah. it's already at docHexplains. Dot com. Yep, I already bought I that. Got. Yep. All right. Okay, very cool. So, Dr. Horning, here we go. Um, so, today's <laughs> topics that we'll cover, cystic fibrosis chronicle, why is an often deadly cystic fibrosis gene not been eliminated from the human genome, and what new treatments are being developed? That's pretty cool stuff. Soaring seed prices, what role do patents and regulation play? And finally, we'll talk about the good old European Court of Justice and their new ruling that crops that have been affected by mutagenesis are not regulated as GMOs. So pretty cool stuff. So the first one is one I'll tackle, and this is on cystic fibrosis. And what's really interesting about cystic fibrosis is that this is an autosomal recessive gene. So it, it's, a, it's a gene that shows up when a carrier and another carrier get together. And uh, one quarter of those offspring by Mendelian segregation will be uh, affected by cystic fibrosis. And it's a really awful disease. It has pulmonary and um, the digestive effects where the cells in the lining of the epithelium uh, do not deal with water relations properly. And you develop a lot of mucus inside the lungs. That's where, you know, serves as a breeding ground and a Petri dish for bacterial infections, all kinds of problems that come from this. And uh, you usually don't live as long um, the average age of death is in the mid 40s, maybe. And it affects a lot of people that there's something like 10 million people in the U.S. that are carriers. So why are you a carrier if why does this gene stick around if it causes early death? And I don't know if you've ever seen someone with cystic fibrosis as a child. You got to you know pound on their back to break loose the, the crud that develops, and lots of antibiotics and all kinds of stuff. So, so that's the disease in a nutshell, and um, it's the most common fatal genetic disease in the U.S., which I, I thought was really cool to learn, and very common in other countries. The big deal is is that there's no good therapy. Because it's happening at the level of the gene, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it's very difficult to treat, right? You, there's no drug that has been developed yet to get in there. And for years, they've talked about this being a primary target for gene therapy, that viral infection of the lungs with uh, a gene that could replace the defective one might be a good way to fix it. And that's been uh, failing now for probably 30 years. There's been a lot of attempts at doing this. 
So the newest thought was, if you can't affect, affect the gene, could you affect the bacteria? And could you stop the effect, infection without antibiotics? And so advanced phage therapeutics is in the early stage cl clinical trial of using what's called phage therapy. I don't know, you want to talk about phage therapy? You're the virus person. No, but it's really cool. I love it. <laughs> so phage therapy is this idea that you can take a virus that infects bacteria and infect bacteria. So actually use phage to be the uh, to hunt down and kill the thing it likes to hunt down and kill the most, bacteria. And this idea of phage therapy is something that's new and looking really exciting. And a lot of this goes back to I really neglected to talk about the etiology of this. It goes back to a gene which is called the transmembrane conductance, reg transmembrane conductance regulator, easy for you to say, uh, CFTR. And the CFTR gene you think you could just replace with a good copy, and uh, you can't. It, 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 it hasn't been done yet. There's a lot of efforts that are looking to do that. Using phage therapy, you get around the problem of antibiotic resistance because you're not using an antibiotic. And if you're just killing the bacteria itself, I suppose you could come up with a resistance to the phage, but that's terribly unlikely. So, you know, that was the major, major gist of the story is, you know, phage therapies are looking like the best way out at this point. Um, I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on the kickoff of this story? Um, I, I don't, but I thought they were also talking about killing off these bacteria as well that collects in the lungs by using these phages? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's the main driver, that phage therapy would would be specifically targeting these specific bacterial species. So right. they're, they're using some sort of a, a receptor on the cell surface right. that would somehow marry up with uh, something on the on the on the virus itself on the phage. Right. But the the other interesting point of this article that I thought was super cool was why hasn't evolution eliminated this? Because so many people, at least until recent evolution, have uh, never made it past early childhood. So how, how is this gene staying around in the population? And it turns out that the carriers may have some enhanced resistance to other diseases. So um, there was a, a discussion of things like cholera, tuberculosis, anything which has some sort of um, potential diarrheal component, I like cholera, there's protection because of the digestive breakdown in the CTFR gene, you're able to retain water better. And in uh, cases of tuberculosis, being able to retain water better. So it's a problem where any place where dehydration is a problem, that a bad cystic fibrosis CFTR gene is actually beneficial. And there's been a number of reports that have been able to show that. So, you know, next time we are having a discussion about cystic fibrosis and uh, you don't want to make it all about you and narcissistic fibrosis, <laughs> I always thought that was funny. Um, can't uh, talk about um, this idea. You know, this is, is sticking around because it confers some sort of benefit. A lot like um, uh, the sickle cell mutation, which causes sickle cell disease, confers mutation to malaria or uh, uh, resistance to malaria. So it's just another example by a modern manifestation of this gene, which is really uh, detrimental to the organism, has a, a potential effect as a real benefit. So, th so that's really uh, the the upshot of that entire uh, cystic fibrosis article. And I for forgot to mention, I neglected to mention, this was written by uh, I believe it's Dr. Sam Moxon, um, and uh, was written for your Genetic Literacy Project. So, any other thoughts on cystic fibrosis? No. Uh -uh. Yeah, you haven't haven't ever dealt much with CF in your in your. Uh, no, I, I know nothing about CF actually, but I, I love bacteriophage. I just think it's really cool. The structures are really amazing. They always remind me of spaceships. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah, it's got that weird like lunar lander look to it. It does. <laughs> yeah, or the like the lunar lander from. Uh, asteroids with that old video game, right? You may not be old enough to remember that. I don't know. Yeah. But let, let's talk about soaring seed prices. Uh, what yeah. role do patents and regulation play? And this was by Emma Kovac. So go ahead, Michelle. Sure. So seed prices have gone up, um, up to 700%. And that is, that is crazy. 700%. And um, 
it's all about affordability, right? I mean, the farmers they need to be able to afford those seeds. And separately, the consumers don't want to pay for more money in view of food, right? And so there's a couple of things that drive the costs that I'm going to talk about. And one is, one is intellectual property. So patents, they actually, what are patents? Do you know what patents are? Yeah, I know of it. <laughs> Do you? Uh, I've had, used to, I used to have patent leather. <laughs> Do you know who the pat, first patent examiner is? Was no. in the United States? Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Edison. Oh, Th Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah first in cool. everything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, how how do uh, IP protections actually increase um, the, the the seed prices? Well, it's it's a pretty expensive process, right? Okay. And so sure, go ahead. Well, well, well. Maybe mention a little bit more about that. I mean, uh, seed these companies that patent seeds, or even let's not even say seeds, varieties of vegetatively propagated material. You know, it's, it's a really long and expensive process. Yes, it is. It very much is so. Um, well, first of all, what is a patent? A patent is going to be the sole right to use, make, um, and uh, and sell a certain invention, and so. If, if you wanted to use someone else's invention from a different from a patent holder, then you would have to pay a licensing fee, and that's a lot of money. So it's necessary in view of product market protection. So that allows the inventor to have the exclusive right to use, make, and sell that particular invention. Um, no one else can use it or make it or sell it unless there's an agreement. And that agreement is a written agreement, and that's called a license. And there, it requires pretty high fees for that. Now, one of the issues in view of licensing is that, is that those agreements are not necessarily publicly available. And so as a result of that, you really don't know how to negotiate a price. And um, that, that causes a little bit of burden in view of that, that process. Um, separately, multiple licenses might be required. So you might have one person that wants to borrow different technologies from different, um, different patent holders, and that increases the price as well. So there's, there's, some, there's some issues that could be optimized that would help developers. And um, in part, you can define what those licensing practices are, as well as making all that, that those, those practices um, available publicly. Um, but why, why are they even necessary? I mean, why do we, you know, people would argue, well, our seeds should be free. Who do they belong to? Right, exactly. Well, it's, it's you got to give an incentive to innovate. And by doing so, you, you give them 20 years so they can bring it up to market and they make that money back that they, they spent all those years and trying to, trying to put together the, what the r and I mean, that is, does not get subsidized. That comes out of your pocket a lot of times. And um, it's expensive. So this is, this is the payback from the United States, right, is to give that, that inventor the, the protection of their, their product, their invention. That's a really good point because a lot of people don't appreciate to create the next generation of a fruit tree or that's a great example. Uh, the next great citrus tree might take 50 years to develop. Um, the next great tomato might take 10. Right. And uh, with climate change, with new pests and pathogens, the breeders always have to be innovating and creating this new germplasm to be able to, to provide something for farmers that fits the environment that makes a product consumers like. The problem with that is that it's super expensive uh, to plant how many, you know, to plant 50 acres of trees to maybe identify one that might work. Right. And, you know, for 10 years, you got to water it, you got to fertilize it, you got to prune it. You got to pay for property tax on the land. So that money's got to come from somewhere. So the patent or the promise of a patent ensures the breeder's rights that they will have some sort of income to continue to innovate and maybe get and maybe cover their old bills <laughs> from the yeah, so regulation is also a big issue. Um, we know that the regulatory process is really extensive when it comes to GM crops, right? 
Um, we, it's in view of the length, we know that the time frame, there's a cost, there's a reliability. Um, and so that, that's going to be somewhat burdensome um, to the developer. And so there is this one statistic that really just blew me away. And do you have any idea how much it costs on average to bring something to market? I, I'm <laughs> Well, I, I don't know if this is on average, but I remember the figure of $130 million in 13 yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. It's, so the figure that they gave um, was $136 million for two decades, 20 years. And that is ridiculous. I can't even, that just blew me away. I mean, climate change is coming, right? <laughs> Can we right. hurry that pro process up? And um, the so it's pretty difficult for for developers to actually plan around this unpredictable timetable too. So maybe that's another place that can be optimized. And it's getting better. I think that the environment around genetic engineering, it was really antiquated going in. And over the last 30 years, we've seen uh, fumbling through this process to regulate things that are pretty safe. And the last story we'll talk about, we'll get into this more. But I think one of the neat things from this article was when you looked at where the majority of the IP protection requests were coming from, it was coming from academic labs and not necessarily industry. Right. And that's pretty cool because that's, you know, I mean, we're working, we're a public institution and we're generating IP, which people say, well, if it's a public institution, we already paid for it. Um, it doesn't pay the bills enough to produce new varieties, which are just enormously expensive. And, and the breeders who are working at universities and public breeding programs, they're they're, they are having good incomes that are coming in, but that's being reinvested back in the development of future varieties or maybe other things. You know, you, your citrus uh, investment can help develop the next avocado, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So, yeah. so lots of interesting things there. Yeah. And then the sort of last component of this article was in view of, of research funding. And I, I bet you have a lot to say about that, huh, Kevin? No? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I almost choked on my own vomit when you said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a bear. I, mean, I was thinking about this this morning, and, you know, my lab has always been very well-funded, but it's always been oh, very wow. well-funded from federal sources and state sources, and uh, occasionally we get a little dribble from industry, but it's, you know, it's Florida strawberry industry. You know, we're not, uh, it's, no one has the big check from Monsanto and Bayer or whatever sitting on the doorstep. It's a uh, federal funding and or state or you know maybe local industry. And uh, this morning I was kind of you know relenting the fact that it's really tough to get funding and we've been submitting proposals and they get great reviews but uh, no check attached. Yeah. And it just as a state where right now we're at five to ten percent funding rates, and that means if you're as good as everybody else, that you got to write twenty proposals to get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you have so much copious free time, right? Well, yeah. Well, and, that's, the, the, and that's problematic. It really is. It, it is because the tools get better and really cool things can be done. And so many people are doing beautiful work. And right. we have, um, we're drowning in our own success. And unfortunately, there's not enough funding to support all the really, really nice work that's out there. And, and to be honest, when I get a rejection and I read it and it says highly meritorious rejected or no money, I, I feel like, all right, at least I competed in a really good pool. Right. Um, so it's, so anyway, you have to, you have to thrive on rejection, which I'm good at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I am, but <laughs> the, the big one is just that 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 time frame is insane that it takes to get through the process. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And so when a company has a bag of seeds that they want to sell, they could either sell that bag for thirty thousand dollars, right, or they could sell it for a hundred dollars and ask you, please don't distribute. You know, right. consider this our intellectual property. And it's, I always give people the analogy that if you buy a copy of uh, Office 365 for your computer or whatever, buy a copy of Office for your computer, you can't go home and make CD-ROMs of it and sell it on eBay. Right. It, it, there's intellectual property. It took time and effort to develop but this novel product. Right. Same with a fruit or a vegetable. And, um, and we're not just talking GMOs. We're talking straight out traditionally bred strawberry. You get one out of 100,000 plants that may be the next big variety. 
the breeder took 15, well, 10 years to develop it. Why should that breeder have to give it away? Right, exactly. So that's why they kind of call this intellectual property. It's, it really is the property of the, uh, the, what is there isn't so much the product, but the process and how the, the, the breeder or the inventor came up with this particular idea. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so that's a that's it's a really nice example. People get really bent out of shape about that. Once I buy the seed, why shouldn't I be allowed to propagate right. it? Right, and a lot of people miss that, and that's unfortunate because yeah, I mean it, it provides. I mean, patents really do provide a big, big motivation to innovate. You know, otherwise, yeah. it, you know, why why innovate? You're not going to get your money back or your time back, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Well, that's why throughout history, all of the inventors were wealthy dudes for the most part, right? right? They were the folks who could afford to screw around and tinker with stuff all the time and had the resources to cover basic necessities. And so what opening this up to patents does is incentivize the small uh, innovators, small companies, uh, university, academic labs to play in that space and come up with new inventions that can speed development and can benefit all of us. So exactly. it's... it's it's a system that could be better, but you know, for the most part, man, we make it work, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, looks like the USDA has could do some um, optimization, a well, lot of optimization. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things that we could do better, and I think that the idea of deregulation—that's a whole nother, you know, whole nother mess with deregulation of genetic engineering. But when the place we see people get upset about this the most is, well, why can't I just buy that bag of seeds and plant a whole bunch more of it because I bought that seed? You know, why can't I hang on to it or sell it or whatever? And uh, and that's it. Just as it's in the spirit of if we incentivize development of new technologies, new technologies will happen because you got to pay for it somehow. And um, I don't know about companies, but I know in academic labs, most breeding programs are not making tons of money. Some of them are, um, but um, most of them don't. And like the honey crisp apple, I was just up in Minnesota, and the honey crisp apple is one of the biggest re re uh, revenue generators for the University of Minnesota. Oh wow! I know I didn't know that. That's that's cool. So when the lights are on and you're able to learn about um, what pro you know your interest in whatever you're interested in up there, uh, that's really one of the big drivers. Um, Wisconsin's got a great program. Florida's got a great program for these things. It's yeah. IP, uh, you know, Warfarin, um, which was came for, stands for Wisconsin Research Alumni Foundation. Oh. <laughs> Warf, Warfarin. Warf. <laughs> um, was a rodenticide that, that uh, came through University of Wisconsin, which was such a foundation of their entire technological enterprise. So IP is an important thing for universities, and it's important, obviously, for businesses. And the protections that are afforded are really good for, for, future, for future development. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yep. So any other thoughts on that, or should we talk about the European Court of Justice? Um, I don't think I have any more thoughts on that. <laughs> but um, it really made me think about about things I've never thought about before. So I really enjoyed this article. Yeah, that's and that's what articles should do. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> may it make us think of things. Uh, all right, so uh, the European Court of Justice, and this is an article that first appeared in Reuters, but uh, followed up in the Genetic Literacy Project. European Court of Justice reinforces ruling that crops that are gene edited via mut mutagenesis, which kind of an odd title, should not be regulated as GMO. So should mutagenized crops be regulated as genetically modified organisms? This is by Fu Yun Chi at Reuters this week. Now, here's what's interesting about this is that if you are, um, for years, they, if you wanted to introduce new traits into crops, so you've got a, a line of seeds that produce whatever, I don't know, what's your favorite vegetable? Broccoli. Broccoli. Yeah, broccoli. Okay. Um, just green cauliflower. Um, uh, broccoli has a, uh, uh, you want to make new broccoli. Well, all you have are what nature gave you, right? The, the antecedents and then the things that have been bred. And that's all you got for genetics. You can't shake the genetic snow globe so much and see where things fall. So mutagenesis gives you that opportunity. They realized back when they started playing with uh, nuclear energy and radiation that you could um, 
bomb the hell out of some kind of organism and cause mutations. And if you did this to seeds or plants, you could cause damage to DNA that would be reflected as cool traits in the next generation. Well, actually it would kill most of them. But once in a while, you would create a beneficial trait, a funny color variant, a flavor variant, a plant that would grow taller, shorter, whatever, because the mutation would stick. How cool. But you didn't know where the mutations were being made. You didn't know what genes were getting hit. All you knew is that it was a product that you liked. And this was in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s. And guess how many people got really bent out of shape about this? Zero? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cared. That Nobody you could, cared. You, yeah, you could bomb this, the plants with, with radiation and screw up the DNA in any kind of way. You could affect any gene that was there, have no idea what you were affecting, but right. nobody really cared. That's right. Yeah. So um, so how do you feel about that? Um, well, that's great. They should continue not caring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does, does the process concern you? Like just randomly modifying, you know, blasting a th something with radiation and changing it and who knows what you did? Um, no, it doesn't. Yeah, you? I mean, it's, it's not really. No, I mean, yeah. it, it's one of these things that happens, and we're good at doing this, and it happens in, in nature because of errors during DNA replication and all that stuff. But um, it, what's really kind of funny about this is that uh, this was totally allowable. Yet when you came to genetic engineering and adding a gene precisely, then um, that was looked down on, right? You couldn't add this gene and make a GMO. But if you mutagenize any, everything, then, and people would say, well, but, well, obviously this is not a problem because when you mutagenize, you're just affecting what was already there. You're not adding, you know, Monsanto's evil, whatever. And, and so this is the way that it was always justified. Okay. Eh, I, all right. Well, I'll, go, I'll give you that. So now gene editing comes along and now we have the opportunity to change one base where you erase one letter in the genome. One specific base. One specific base in a gene that we understand. We could target our, 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 our changes. And now people are saying, well, no, that's not acceptable. Can't do that. That's GMO. But then you say, well, okay, well, if I, the one targeted change is a GMO that we can't accept, how can we possibly accept thousands or tens of thousands random changes? And this was levied by some French farmers back in 2015 who went to the EU Court of Justice and said, um, this makes zero sense. And we, we need to regulate mutagenized plants <laughs> or mutagenized uh, varieties. And um, the European Court of Justice in their, in their great uh, wisdom said back then, no, you don't need to do that because uh, you don't need to because we, we're not exactly sure why, but don't worry about it. And they went through this recently and went through a whole discussion on this again. And I had to read this verbatim because it was crazy. It says the directive, and this is the, the legal rulings here, should not apply to organisms obtained through certain techniques of genetic modification, which have been conventionally used in a number of applications and shown a long safety record. So if Radiation. you do, yeah, right. So, so I, I, I kind of thought about this. Like, if, it's like saying that, well, we've used nuclear power for a long time, so let's just build some new reactors and not worry about you know inspections or oversight, right? Or better yet, let, let's just uh, let's not worry about the, how how much we tighten down the bolts. Let's just throw it together, and we don't even need a blueprint. Let's just put some radiation, uh, put some uranium in a in a place, and uh, take out the fuel rods, and let's see it go, and it'll be fine. And, and it really isn't a great analogy because plants don't have any inherent risk like that. Um, but it is an apt analogy because what they're saying is because it always worked means it's always going to work going forward. And they've created some negative stuff by mutagenesis. Um, there's a potato that was generated that made people really sick because of high levels of alkaloids. And that was identified after, you know, it was developed through traditional breeding and mutagenesis. So... Um, the the uh, looking at this particular um, process, the European Court has decided that gene editing is not acceptable. Changing the one or a few number of gene, of, of bases in, in right. the DNA, but uh, mutagenesis is totally acceptable. 
<laughs> at random. Yeah. I no, no, no. Uh, so uh, in the, in the area of how you would consider risk versus benefit, how do you feel about that? Oh, I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I would rather go, I would go with higher specificity, knowing exactly what you're doing, you know. Um, so will this but, ever change? And I agree with you, right? You want the thing that's more specific, but why do you think? Um, what do you think the response of environmental and anti-GMO groups is? Well, I, they they prove to be anti. Um, science, a lot of them are, right? And um, I think it's ridiculous. They don't, it makes no sense to me. Can you find any logical explanation in view of their position? Well, well, and, I mean, thinking especially about this one is a great one to illuminate and why I really wanted to talk about this. It's great for folks who are really cutting their teeth on these discussions is here we have the random and wacky mutagenesis that we have no idea what we're doing, and that's okay. Yet yeah. if we target one gene and we make one little base change and we can go back and verify it and understand it and we know the gene we affected, that's forbidden. <laughs> and, right. it, and it really illuminates the intent of these groups. It's not about safety. It's about stopping technology. Yep, exactly. And they even say, well, this is just a new era of GMO 2.0 through the back door, right? That's how they even phrased it. Yep. And so, so you know, it really doesn't pay attention to risk or precautionary principle or any of that stuff because the EU Court of Justice always hides behind precautionary principle. Like, well, uh -huh. we don't understand what this gene does, so maybe we shouldn't mess with it. Yet they say that the... Uh, mutagenesis like this, this wide-scale mutagenesis, is completely consistent with precautionary principle because it always worked in the past. Yeah, but it didn't always work in the past because there was a potato that did right. not work. So, yeah, that just that makes no sense. Yep, so once again, the European Court of Justice leaves me scratching my head and wondering. And the really sad part about this is that look at how EU scientists are affected and EU farmers that don't get access to the best and brightest because everyone is gene editing. And if you look at China, you look at US, you look at uh, so many other cases around the globe where the scientists are taking advantage of this uh, relatively democratizing technology. And the EU is going to be last to the table. Yeah, I know. So it's really the, the process, the method that they're fighting, right? They just exactly. don't want us to, to practice what modern technologies, right? Right. It's, uh, it's, they're, they're very Amish like that. They're very Amish. But Amish, Amish like GMOs. I think yeah, the Amish love the technology. <laughs> it's actually the fun part about going to meetings in Canada. Um, I would go to meetings in Canada, and they have a lot of um, colonies of Mennonites and Hedonites and folks up there. And they're not listening to the podcast necessarily. I think they do have certain restrictions on technologies. But mm -hmm. I had such a good time speaking with those guys. And they were predominantly men um, who came to the meeting. And um, that I would give my talk and say, this is really neat technology. Here's how it works. And they would they'd never ask questions right after but if they could pin me down in the trade show or in an elevator somewhere they would say hey what's going on and they were so interested and so engaged and they wanted to know all the risk and benefit and i just fell in love with these guys and and you know offered to go up to the colony to talk to the farmers there oh, wow. um, never got an invitation that was complete because they can't really cover the cost of your airfare <laughs> right right okay you know, I don't need an honorarium, but you can fly me in at least. And, a, you know, ticket to Canada is a little costly. But, um, but so, so you're right. Yeah, it was kind of bad for me to say they're very Amish in their approach to technology. But they're very uh, overly precautious and to a point where it limits their farmers' access and, and uh, potential industries in the EU. So, yeah, this is, this is too bad. I hope, I hope, I hope this works out. Um, I hope the EU changes their mind. It will ultimately. And it's one of those things that when the writing is on the wall and we know that it will be um, eventually here, that this is when it falls on the hands of folks like you and folks like me and folks like our listeners, that when you can't get innovation application fast enough, that's where communication comes in. Okay. And we are the ones who soften that interface. So folks who listen to this, folks like you, folks like me, how can we help 
speed this process. And it's about countering the misinformation in social media and, and covering those hashtags, glyphosate, GMO, and stepping in and just kind of planting the seed when you see, read something insane. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which is often, unfortunately, right? Well, it's what you do very well. You know, I, I, I was, you're very good at getting in there and at least uh, you, you take on a little more aggressive position than I do, but you know, it takes all kinds, you know, it takes brawlers for a diplomat. You need a few brawlers. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Are you optimistic that the EU will change anytime yes. soon? Yes, are. it will. Yeah. It's going to start with gene editing. It'll be sometime in the next, next within five years, probably sooner than later. They've I, done yeah. massive analyses on this. They've done big changes. Heck, they just re-upped the glyphosate for a year. So yeah, yeah. after an 11,000 page report that said nothing to see here, this is perfectly fine. It's so, not carcinogenic. So the EU, um, well, it's a, it's a probable carcinogen by IARC standards, right? I, even they can't say it is. Yeah, they they so, uh, and you're right. There's no evidence that we can identify that shows that at levels used that there's any evidence of car carcinogenicity. Oh yeah, the hiccups. Maybe. So maybe <laughs> so maybe hiccups is a good place to put a lid on it. Any final thoughts? Uh no, this was fun. I it hope was. I get better at this. This is fun. Yeah. Oh. Thank you for thinking of me. Well, I, I, I think of you, with, I was trying to figure out who would be a good guest host. And I know we interact a lot in social media, and I know you're getting ready to launch Doc H, the, sci yep. the farmer scientist, and hope people will search that out and look for it. And yeah. if people wanted to connect with you on social media, where would they find you? Um, I'm, not, I'm pretty dead on social media at the moment, but I'm going to get up there. It would right. be all Doc H explains or Doc H um, all my, my science communication will be this month some point, and hopefully I can come back and do, do another article with you, uh, Kevin. We could do that. And, but here's the big thing, though. So you're, you're, cause you were, uh, your, your normal personal Twitter thing seems to not be happening right now. Oh, oh, I know, because I'm, I'm just busy, really, really yeah. busy. But um, I haven't yeah. seen it. But so you really want folks to follow the Doc H account. So if you go to DocHexplains.com, you will, when that launches, when list that launches. the Twitter and all that stuff there. All the stuff that you will need. Yep. Okay. I so will that, be loud and obnoxious. So you'll probably see me no matter what. <laughs> Right? No, that's totally cool. And that's why I would, that's why I wanted to do this with you today because I know that you have you're brewing something in the in the uh, cauldron that that you didn't necessarily tell me a hundred percent about. Um, I've seen little bits of it and it looks really good. And yeah. I I wanted to kind of prime the audience, you know, kind of uh, give them a little appetizer here. So yeah, uh, thank you for that. So yeah, thank uh, you. So follow Michelle, follow me at uh, Kevin Folta at K E V I N F O L T A. Follow Cameron at A. ACA ACE. <laughs> I always get this confused. ACSH, American Council of Society, ACSH. And uh, also follow the Genetic Literacy Project because without them, this doesn't happen. Uh, they are very instrumental in providing a uh, forum, a, uh, well, the uh, major visibility of this through their portal. A, uh, Genetic Literacy Project grows all the time and can always use your support. So the best way you can do that is by liking and sharing their content and making sure that gets out to more of your networks. It's, it's a really important resource that's grown tremendously over time and something that I'd like to see continue. So thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much for following us. And <laughs> sorry, and we'll talk to you again next week. <laughs>